Luke 17. And let your eye run down the scripture, please, to verse 26 and verse 27. It says, and the Lord Jesus is the speaker. And as it was in the days of Noe, that is Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Let's pray. Father, take of your own word and inscribe it upon our hearts this morning. We pray, Father, that you would glorify your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Open our ears to hear, open our hearts to receive and to understand the engrafted Word of God, which is able to save the soul. So we love you, Father. We love you because you first loved us, even as we have heard around the table this morning. You died, Lord Jesus, for the ungodly. You died for us. We thank you, Lord, we're saved and we're washed in the blood of the Lamb this morning. Glorify your Son, glorify your name. For Jesus' sake, I ask it. Amen. AD 2020, the year we're living in, says, as it was in the days of Noah. Notice our Lord, what he says in our first verse, verse 26. And as it was in the days of Noah, or Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. Speaking of his coming. Speaking of his second coming. Verse 27, they did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. We know that in the Gospels we would take Noah's ark as a type of Christ and, and that's rightly so. And those who were in the ark were saved and those who are in Christ are saved and that is correct. But there's a lot more around the story of Noah and the ark, if we would call it that. There's a lot more in it. I want to look this morning at names, meanings, numerology. We're going to try and keep it as simple as we can. But there's a lot more to do with it. It says that in the days of Noah would be like the days of his coming, his second coming. And I think when we see our, our streets and our towns and our cities and our nations, we see that it is like the days of Noah. There's a lot of things that are happening. We'll look at it in a moment and a little later on. And there's a lot of things that are signaling that the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Notice here, if you go with me to the book of Genesis, let's go to the narrative of Noah and the flood. Go to the book of Genesis, please, and we'll start in Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5. I think I'll be doing a bit more like teaching this morning rather than preaching this morning. My intention is to any, anyhow. Verse 28 of Genesis 5. And Lamech lived in 180 and two years and begot a son and called his name Noah, saying... This same shall comfort us concerning our work and our toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. And Lamech lived after he begot Noah 590 and five years, and he begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Lamech were 770 and seven years, and he died. And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Notice here, Noah, the son of Lamech. Lamech means powerful, powerful. And he was 777 years when he died. He was 182 years of age when Noah was born. It says he begot a son. Genesis 5 and 29, he says, he called his name Noah, saying, This same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. Now, not too far from the days of Adam in Eden, 
when Adam's sin and death came, then we have the Lord cursing the ground. He cursed the serpent, cursed the ground. He cursed the woman in childbirth. Why you suffer so much pain, ladies? And that's why us men are never able to understand it. And also, he said the man would wipe the sweat of his brow and eat his bread in the sweat of his brow because of the land. So everything on planet earth here is cursed. And when Christ comes, Christ will bring us not only into his kingdom, but Christ will make this earth a new earth. And he's going to renovate the earth and that which was lost in Adam, in Eden, paradise lost will be paradise regained in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Note this though. Here the sin and curse on the earth. We're told that Lamech says that when Noah was born, he'll bring comfort. Now Noah's name can mean comfort. It means rest and it means peace. And so he calls him the name which is prophetic. So the names in scripture generally mean something. They're just not there. Well, somebody picked the name out of a hat and that was the end of that. They're there for a reason. So Noah means peace, rest, or even comfort. Noah's father, Lamech, it is thought that he, Lamech, had heard from a boy of what had happened in Eden because we are told of the genealogical line that comes further back. We're going to take a couple of generations or so step back here and we're going to look at what happened before this because it's important. It's important. Noah's father, Lamech, has thought he heard from a boy in the words of his father who was Methuselah. I'm sure we all know who Methuselah was. Methuselah was the man who lived 969 years before he died. So Noah's grandfather is Methuselah. Now, people might say, do you really believe that Methuselah lived 969 years? And the answer is, yes, I do. Every single one of them. I believe that. And the Lord then later says to Noah, for they were all living long, he says to Noah, and he says to Lamech, he tells the generations that he would cut down the years of man to around 120 years. And how does he do that? But when the flood came, there was a canopy around the earth of water. And so since the water came upon the earth, the canopy had weakened and lessened. It wasn't there anymore. And it's even believed that, that scientists believe there was a greenhouse effect on the earth that even tomatoes were maybe this height. They have actually grown them, believing uh, uh, what uh, it would have been like in the days before the flood. So when the flood comes, comes up, and the, and the rain comes down, the canopy was gone, and so sun, the sun, S-U-N, would bring an early death to humanity because of the strength of it. So notice here, when he says, or it says, pardon me, Methuselah was 969 years old, I believe every single word of it because they lived longer. It is believed that they grew bigger. They grew really big men. If you were to go to like of Kent Hovind and people like that in their teachings, they, they have looked at this, they have studied this and tried a lot of these things out. Notice here, it says in, of Methuselah, let your eye run back the way up the chapter. It says, in verse 21, and Enoch lived 60 and five years and begot Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begot Methuselah 300 years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. And Methuselah lived in 180 and seven years and begot Lamech. And Methuselah lived after he begot Lamech 780 and two years and begot sons and daughters and all the days of Methuselah were 960 and nine years and he died. Methuselah's name means, his name means when he dies, it shall be sent. Take note of that. 
Methuselah's name means when he dies, it shall be sent. Can you imagine now they realizing God is going to send something cataclysmic upon the earth that when Methuselah dies, something big is going to happen and they would wait every day. Can you imagine if something cataclysmic, we know it was a flood, but until the Lord tells Noah to build the ark, none of them know what this would be upon the earth. And can you imagine all of those years? Can you imagine them thinking, well, Methuselah must be alive. I haven't seen him in a year or two, but he must be alive because this cataclysmic event hasn't happened yet. You see, the idea is that they believed God for what he said. They didn't just believe in God, they would believe God. And the problem is, brothers and sisters, you can imagine for all of this time, them wondering and thinking, one, when is this going to come? Then two, there would be those who would say, this is a load of nonsense, it's not going to happen. But those who would understand and believe were only Noah, his sons, and his wife, their wives that would enter the ark. Think about that. By the time it happened, when we're told that the Lord Jesus is coming back again, the world thinks you're crazy. In fact, some of the church think you're crazy now too. The Roman church think you're crazy. It's been announced that they don't believe Jesus is coming back again. Sometimes it's easy because Peter even says that there will be those, there will be scoffers in the last days saying, where is the sign of his coming? And brothers and sisters, as believers, as blood-bought, blood-washed, born-again, spirit-filled believers, we just don't believe in God. We believe God. We believe him for what he says. When he says he will come, he will come. And when the world thinks you're crazy, you're not crazy. They think you're brainwashed. You're not. You're blood-washed. And we must remember to keep our eyes, our minds, and our hearts fixed and focused entirely and completely on the Scripture, on what God has said he will do, on what God has said will happen. Can you imagine all of these years, these people saying, Methuselah's still alive. Listen, people were living, maybe then dying, even a few hundred years old. They were living, they were dying, Methuselah was living on. Can you see, because he's the oldest living man in the Word of God in the Bible. 969 years, and can you imagine why did God allow him to live so long? Can I put my tuppence worth in? I believe it was because of God's love, grace, and mercy. I believe because God was giving space to repent. Because God had set Noah as a righteous man in the earth, to preach, a preacher of righteousness, and God was giving time for the word to get out, for the word to go out before this cataclysmic event would happen and the flood would be sent upon the land. I believe today God is giving us that space to get the word out there. I believe that God is giving us the space to tell our workmates, to tell our families, to tell our friends and our colleagues, to tell our neighbors and to witness, to reach out to them that God is going to send something cataclysmic to the earth. And brothers and sisters, as people think it's going to be a lovely, happy, jolly time of picnic. No, he's going to come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to the Apostle Paul, to the Thessalonican church. And so God in his grace and his mercy, see, God is sovereign and he is justified in everything that he does. He's justified in every action that he moves in. And he's justified in every judgment he proclaims over the earth. God's justified in everything. There's not one of us sitting in here, not one of us that deserve the mercy of God. God, I believe, will soon send his son. As it was in the days of Noah, in 2020 AD, so shall it also be in the coming of the Son of Man. 
They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were given in marriage. And, and, and he goes on because he, what he's saying is they were getting on with life their way. What they want to do, and we see that all around us. Man does that which is right in his own eyes. And because man does that which is right in his own eyes, the Lord in his grace and mercy is withholding his wrath. It's like a dam which is about to burst open at any moment that no man or woman can escape from by the sending of his son. When he comes, his feet will rest upon the Mount of Olives. And listen, if you want to see Jerusalem, you better get there quickly because there's going to be a massive earthquake. The Mount of Olives will split in the middle. Do you know from the Mount of Olives, right the whole way down through the Middle East, right down to the Horn of Africa, they've found a fault line. The Word of God tells us it even before man finds it. And Christ will come and his feet will stand upon the Mount of Olives that will split in two. The city will be destroyed. You know why? Because the new Jerusalem will be coming. Who is the new Jerusalem? We are the new Jerusalem. We will enter in the fullness of the kingdom. The kingdom is in us, but we will enter into the fullness of the kingdom. Now listen, brothers and sisters, I believe 969 years was God's mercy and grace upon the earth, upon this people, that they would turn at the preaching of the righteousness of Noah. Noah was the man who was preaching righteousness, but yet he brought rest, he brought peace, and he brought comfort, and everyone turned him away. I find as a preacher, I find as a preacher sometimes it can be very disheartening when you're preaching, 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 and, and I'm, I'm grateful to the Lord because he gives us fruit for the labor on a regular basis. I'm so grateful, it's all of the Lord's doing. But sometimes a preacher can feel down. Sometimes a, a preacher can, can feel a bit useless because he's been preaching with gusto and preaching so long and reaching out so much and trying so hard, as it were, trying to get his P's and Q's together and making sure he brings the people a good word, that whether it's in the street or in the church. And what happens? Sometimes they see no fruit for their labor. But brother, listen, you continue on in this because I'll tell you why. Because the salvation is of the Lord. And you sow, another will water, and God gives the increase. It's God who does that. And it's easy to get, as it were, dejected and, and disgruntled within yourself. Lord, we're seeing nothing. Noah was a preacher of righteousness and only his own family were saved. Only his own family got saved. Himself, his wife, his three sons, Shem, Ham, Japheth, and their three wives. There were eight souls that entered into the ark and God shut them in. God sealed the door of the ark. Thank God that when he saves us, we're told in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18 maybe. You can correct me on that. It says that we are, as believers, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That when we get saved, he seals us like putting a seal into hot, softened wax. Notice here about this. When he dies, Methuselah, it shall be sent. Can you imagine it was 182 years with the thoughts of God's terrible, cataclysmic event, but man being man soon, put, soon puts it out of his head and puts it behind his back and thinks God is a myth. Think the Bible, the word of God is a lie. That it has no substance and it cannot stand the test of time nor reality because it's fanciful and it's full of fairy tales. And hence the, 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 the deadened mind of man, the depraved nature of humanity turns away the word of God, no longer wants to believe it. 182 years later, no one believed. No one believed. Church, do you ever feel? Do you ever think that in this day and age, do you ever think that the more you're talking to people, 
the less and less Christians you're finding wherever you are? Do you ever feel it sometimes that even the more Christians you talk to, you wonder, are they even saved at all? Do they even know him? Man's heart is rotten. Follow your heart, says man in the world. Follow your heart. Brother, sister, please do not follow your heart. Please do not follow your heart. The scripture tells us the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. Even the disciples in the night when the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. We came around the table with those scriptures. And even that night, there was one who was a devil. There was one who was off that old serpent's seed. That devil with the mentality and the heart of wickedness, Judas Iscariot. He would betray our Lord. And you know when Jesus says, one of you is a devil and is going to betray me, do you know what, they, do you know what all of the disciples said? All of them? They said to him, is it I, Lord? Is it I? Am I going to betray you? You know why? Because they didn't know even their own heart sitting with Christ in the midst of them and them in his presence. Keep your heart in tune, sister. Keep your heart in tune, brother. And as my pastor used to tell us all the time, keep short accounts with God. Keep short accounts with God. The word out there says, Christ will never come. The word out there says, there's no such thing as a God. By the way, I've seen a poster of some young woman. She was in a crowd. And she had a poster above her head, and on it it says, proud to be going to hell. She's holding it up like this, proud to be going to hell. Oh, dear. If she even knew what one second would be like, she would cry for mercy. I got a thought yesterday after the baptismal service for, for tonight at the drive-in. And all the nights at the drive-in, I haven't been using notes because I wanted the Lord just to strip it right back. You know, just ordinary, plain, simple gospel preaching. And this came to me about all the words that the atheists said before they died. So I picked a few out and I had written a few down last night. And I'm going to bring for the first time some pages. The boys laugh at me because the most sometimes I have is a post-it note with a couple of scriptures written on it to keep me in tune. And I've written it out tonight and I've got a, few, a couple of pages worth. And what I thought of was, we're going, uh, I'm going to look at how atheists on their deathbed, what they said. And I'm going to tell you, brothers and sisters, if you come out, it will horrify you. Big, bold as brass, atheists. There is no God. You want to hear the recorded words on their deathbed? I know if I had just listened to the scripture, I put the scripture in that they should have known, should have listened to, and should have obeyed. Outside, we're finding atheism. Listen, Marxism, all the same, all off the same sheet. Communism, socialism, left-wing liberalism, all of those groupings that are coming together, all bunching together in one, all Christ-hating, all gospel-denying. And they're coming together, they're growing and they're growing, and what they're doing, they're infiltrating from their groups into your children's programs. Into your children's programs. To program your children. Why do you think you call it a program? Because it programs you. It comes right into our children's uh, little innocent so-called videos or movies and, and the, 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 the wickedness that's in it. By the children get up into primary school, they're taught things that even adults shouldn't be taught. 
I said this a good while ago, and you listen to this. Do you know the next thing they'll bring out? That pedophilia is a sexual orientation. It's already coming. It's already coming. As it were in the days of Noah. Notice here, we're told in Genesis 5 and verses 22 and verse 24, and all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not for God took him. Enoch was a prophet. How do you know that Enoch was a prophet? You can write this down if you're taking notes, but uh, we haven't time to maybe go to all of it. I tell you, that's just flick to it. Book of Jude. Way to the end of your Bible before revelation of Jesus Christ. Book of Jude, just a few verses. Verse 14. Jude speaks of Enoch. Tells of Enoch's prophecy. And Enoch, verse 14 And Enoch also, notice the number, the seventh. He's the seventh from Adam. That's important. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these things, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Now, that needs a study in itself because it may not just be you think, well, it's all the believers. A lot of this these things can mean actually, in other words, for angels. I'll have to do a study on that for you sometime. Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. What for? To execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So Christ is coming with the hosts of heaven, and he's coming to take vengeance on the ungodly who have spoken against him. The idea is who have lived against him. So Enoch was a prophet who prophesied of it. And in Hebrews chapter 11, and in verse 5, tells us of Enoch, he had a testimony that he pleased God. Enoch had a testimony that he pleased God. Notice, Enoch means dedicated, or Enoch means initiated. Dedicated or initiated. And he was the seventh from Adam. Notice, it means he's seven in the genealogical line from our father Adam. So here he is, number seven. Means dedicated, initiated, he prophesies, he had a testimony that he pleased God. Number seven in the scripture. Numbers are important. Number seven in the scripture, it means or gives the idea of completion or perfection. Completion or perfection. So when we put Enoch being the seventh, His name means dedicated or initiated that he prophesied of the coming of Christ, the second coming before the first coming. Notice the second coming. When we put it together, it gives the idea that a dedicated life initiates a perfect walk, a perfect witness, and a perfect testimony. Here's something you must answer that I must answer daily, regularly. Brother, sister, How's your testimony with God? Brother, sister, how's your walk with the Lord? And so we pause to think. Notice here, so Enoch was number seven. Methuselah was number eight. He was the eighth from Adam. The number eight means, or gives the idea of a new beginning. A new beginning. It gives the idea of a new order or a new creational beginning. But the number eight also gives the idea of eternity because it's a number that doesn't stop. Number eight, 
you can keep going around the number eight, the figure eight. New beginnings every time. New creation. Speaks of eternity, number eight. When I was a wee boy, my mom and dad bought me a Skelectrix track and it was a figure of eight. And used to sit and, well, if you got it round the eight without the car flying off the end, you were a really good driver. It was a number eight. Seven is completion and perfection of God. Number eight gives the idea of, e- of eternity. Gives the idea of a new beginning or a new order or a new creation. Listen, for example, in Israel, the boys were circumcised on the eighth day. On the eighth day. Now it's the circumcision of the heart. And those who are circumcision of the heart, is they are what? A new creature in Christ. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus was on the first day, but when we count it in a row, we have the seventh day, what would be our Saturday, being the Sabbath. If we count it in a row, Sunday, the resurrection day, would be the eighth day. New beginning. Resurrected Christ. Eternal. Deity in humanity. Now stay with me on this. Notice this. After the Feast of Tabernacles in John chapter 7, it was the the day was that great day of the feast. They feasted all week, and then it was on the eighth day, or which would have been the first day again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Jesus came to the Feast of Tabernacles, and it's then that he cried, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. For as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. That was on the eighth day as they counted it. That was on the eighth day. So notice, that was the last day, the great day of the feast. So Lamech was the ninth from Adam. We're coming closer. Methuselah was the eighth. Lamech was the ninth. Methuselah, number eight, new creation, new creation. New beginning, the number eight. When he dies, he is with me. When he dies, it shall be sent. His son Lamech is here, number nine. They're waiting for this deluge to come. They're waiting for it to happen, or they're waiting for something cataclysmic to happen. And it doesn't seem to happen. His son Lamech, Noah's father, is number nine. The ninth from Adam. The ninth from Adam. Notice here, the number nine gives the idea of finality. For example, the Lord Jesus Christ died, gave up the ghost on the cross on the ninth hour. On the ninth hour. And he cried, it is finished. Now, when Jesus knew that all things were now accomplished, he cried, it is finished. The ninth hour. So nine gives the idea of finality. That would be 3 p.m. our time. Nine also speaks of the giftings and the fruit of the Holy Spirit to the church. There's nine fruit of the Spirit and there's nine gifts of the Spirit in the church. And that was the finality. God equipping his church until that which is perfect has come. Do you see it? The Lord Jesus Christ. The nine fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. The nine gifts of the Spirit. Don't ask me to rend them all off. Notice here. Noah is now the tenth from Adam. The number ten stands for God's divine order. God's divine order. Let me just 
come off this a second to give you an idea what this means. So number 10 is God's divine order. It was believed that if a family could gather in 10 to eat the Passover lamb when coming out of Egypt, they gather in 10. That was a divine order. And the blood was on the doorpost and the door lintels. The number 10, uh, we have 10 commandments. God's divine order. Here is the 10 commandments. We have the parable of the 10 virgins, five wives and five footish. We have the northern kingdom of the 10 tribes of Israel. To whom the word would go when scattered and through whom the word would come when delivering it to the nations. God's divine order. For example, God's divine order, number 10. God's perfect government is number 12. Number 11. Number 11 is God's divine order plus one, added to. You can't add to God's divine order, brother or sister. We can't do those things. What God does, it's God's will. For example, when the, the, the cart was, the user um, was coming with a, a, a high, oh, was it a hija in the new cart? And the Ark of the Covenant that was with the Philistines were put on the new cart. But that's not how God's divine order said to bring the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. It was to be on staves on the priest's shoulders and it was to be borne in with blood being shed as a way of blood for them to come in. But they decided, and David says, put it on a new culture, it's lovely and new. We have made this for you, Lord, we'll bring it in. And the, the oxen stumbled and the cart looked as though it was going to fall off, or pardon me, the ark looked as though it was going to fall off the cart. And Uzzah put his hand to it to steady it. And the Lord smote him. Now listen, brother, listen, sister. God wasn't unjust in doing that because they were trying to do things their way instead of God's way. And you can't do it your way, neither can I. We must do it exactly as God has laid it down and planned it. Exactly as God has told us and we must be saved only and exactly by the way the scriptures tell us. By grace, through faith and that, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God and not of works, lest any man should boast. Yusha put his hand to the work of the Lord. Yusha put his strength as though he could help the things of God on his own merit, with his own mentality. And the problem was when he'd done that, God smote him. And that shows us there are men and women who think that they will be in God's kingdom, they will be in God's heaven, they will be in God's glory simply by what they can do. If I do a little bit of church or if I do a little bit of religion or if I do a little bit of this or that, I can put my hand to it. Sure, I'm a good person, but God will bring you down to judgment. It must be. It has to be God's way, for there is no other way. Why do you think in John chapter 14 and verse 6, the Lord Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Because there's only one way, and that is God's way, and that was through his perfect, divine, and holy, sinless spotless lamb, his impeccable son. Notice here, Lamach was the ninth. So you have nine, ten, teaching you to count this morning, am I? I learned this myself. Ten to twelve, perfect order, perfect government. Number eleven, adding two, you can't add to God. Perfect government, one down to eleven, taken away from twelve is eleven. And you can't take away from it. You can't add to the word of God and you can't take away from the word of God. Listen, let me run this past you just briefly. For example, in 9-11, Tars were like a number 11. The word, trade, center. Oh dear, what do you think that was? That was Babylon the Great. That's Babylon the Great. 
That's the Edomite banking cartels in their heyday. Here they are setting up like a number 11, the two twin towers. Babylon the Great. Let me add this, 9, 11, 9, 1 and 1 is 11, isn't it? There's so many more of these we could go on. I just haven't time to go into them. You know what they were doing? They're taking away from what God's perfect government is. Trying to set up their own government. And now, as it were in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. What are they trying to do today? Britain is two, you ready? Britain is two trillion in debt now. Two trillion in debt. So here's what a two trillion looks like, you ready? If you paid one million per day from when they guessed Stonehenge was made, you still wouldn't be finished it today. You'd still be in debt. God said to Israel not to put use debt usury or high extortionate interests on your people. And what are we doing today? You and I are slaves. Believe it or not, we are economic slaves to a new world order. And while the world doesn't know if they're chasing their tail or they're chasing someone or something else. They haven't a clue what's happening. Thank God that we have the scriptures. We thank the Lord that we know the scriptures. Thank God that we know and see what is happening. And we, they call, there's this word going about called the woke. Who's heard of that, the woke? People are woke. Well, listen, never mind woke. We are woke. We have walked in the light of the word. God has told us all of this before it happened. As it were in the days of Noah, everything at the time of the day of Noah, there was, it was rife with violence. It filled the earth. Man's mind was wicked continually all the time. And everything, I can only begin to imagine what they were doing because all I need to look at now is outside my own front door. So number nine gives the idea of the finality. Number 10, God's perfect order. Number 11 speaks of rebellion. Rebellion to God's perfect order and rebellion to God's government. And what have we got today? Nothing but rebellion to God's perfect order. Nothing but rebellion to God's perfect government. That's what you're seeing. See, when you see them going through the streets and the BLM and all those sort of things, the Antifa, it's all communism. It's all communism. It's Marxism. I'm going to close here. I might do another morning. I don't know. Notice here, the Lord says he would come when things get like Noah's day. For example, Genesis chapter 6, please, as we round this up. Genesis chapter 6. And verse 5, notice, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. There you are, see? Isn't that today we're speaking of, isn't it? And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the earth, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Notice what it says. They were evil continually, the thoughts of their mind and of their heart. I can only 
But imagine what, when we look outside, how much worse we'll get before Christ returns. And how much more hated you, church, and I will be because we love the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe this whole uh, coronavirus scandemic I believe that in this time, while man may have done things for evil, God is showing things for the good. Because the more I hear of people saying, the Lord is coming, the Lord, it's on people's lips now. Surely this is the sign of the times. I'll, I'll be honest, I think people are adding too much, uh, posting too much on social media about negative things. Listen, post scripture, tell them about the Lord. But listen to this. I believe in this time, God is also sifting his church. God is sifting. And I'll tell you why, because there are those who are professors and they can't stick the heat. But then there are those who are possessors. They possess Christ. They know him. They worship him. They take their stand for him. And they love the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you a professor? Or a possessor? Are you a professor? Or a possessor? Noah being the tenth from Adam shows God's complete and perfect order. His name means rest, peace, or comfort. Methuselah, his grandfather, when he dies, it shall be sent. God in his grace calls Noah. Here's our last verse for this morning. Notice here, verse 8 of Genesis chapter 6. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. All of the earth was in wickedness, but Noah found grace. The word grace there is the word kin or chanan. And this is what it means. It gives the idea of one bowing down, stooping down in kindness to an inferior. God the superior being, the great eternal spirit, Elohim, the creator of the earth, Yahweh, the great redeeming God. He bowed down, and while the earth was putrid and was full of ungodliness, he stooped down in kindness to a man called Noah. Noah, build an ark. Noah, here's the dimensions. Specific dimensions because only the specific dimensions that are followed by Noah, only those would be able to take the strain of the deluge. The first time the word for atonement comes in the, in the Bible is when God says, thou shalt pitch, P-I-T-C-H, thou shalt pitch the ark within and without. In other words, put this tar on the outside. Put the tar or the pitch on the inside. You know what it means? Thou shalt make atonement in the ark. There'll be an atonement inside the ark. Brothers and sisters, Christ is the ark. His blood is our atonement. There were eight souls in the ark. Do you know who the first one in the ark was? Shem, Ham, Japheth? No, no. Their wives? No. Noah? No. God. God was. How do you know? Because God said to Noah, Come thy, thou thy family into the ark. He said, Come. He didn't say, Go. Come. God was in Christ. 
reconciling the world unto himself. AD 2020. Let me climb the mountain again here. AD 2020. As it were in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the coming of the Son of Man. They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were given a marriage, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. Listen, don't you give up. Don't lose sight of the things of God and keep your eyes fixed and focused. No matter what happens in life, no matter what's going on out there, no matter the negativity, no matter the crowds, no matter who's against you, no matter what's coming on, the, on our nation, no matter what's going on, no matter what the government says, keep looking up. Look up and lift up your heads for your, what is it? I think as you're sleeping this morning. Would you say redemption? redemption? Your redemption draweth nigh. Christ is coming. Are you ready? God bless us this morning. I have a lot more there. I'll see how the Lord leads me. Maybe do more next week. I believe with all my heart that he's coming soon. I believe it. I can feel it. Say this and we'll get the team up. There was a man out walking one day. It was a cloudy day, windy. He sees a wee boy holding something. And he notices a string going up, way up into the sky. The wee boy's like this. And the man comes up and says, Son, what are you doing? He says, I'm flying the kite. I'm flying a kite. He says, son, but how do you know the kite's up there? You can't see it with the clouds. Listen, the wee boy says, because I can feel the tug. I can feel the tug. Believer, do you feel the tug? He's coming. I don't know when, don't know the day, don't know the hour, but he's coming. The wickedness, it's all being reported now in Hollywood. I'm sure you are all aware of it. Full of rotten, filthy pedophiles. God has shown them up for all that they are. And he will come. The word convinced doesn't mean he's going to convince them to be nice, the ungodly, as Jude says. It means he will come and show them their sin and judge them accordingly. Judge them accordingly. Let's keep the faith. Don't lose heart. And let's go on in God because Christ is coming. Amen.